right, so we are still in 1 Corinthians uh, 15. Have you ever had uh, one of those experiences where, uh, well, I'm sure we all have, where somebody's kind of trying to get it both ways, talking out both sides of their mouth, you know? Uh, sometimes we, we want to pick and choose what we'll take, and I'll leave that and, and, and keep this, and uh, which, by the way, a little free marriage advice, uh, you can be happy or right. But, but if you insist on winning all, the argument all the time, yeah, you can't have them both, right? Um, so in 1 Corinthians, uh, you know, we, we've, this series has addressed the mess. We've been looking at, you know, there were lots of messy things in the early church, and especially in the church in Corinth. And so that's what this letter's been about. Paul's been addressing some of these issues. And in chapter 15 specifically... Uh, He's addressed the issue of the resurrection. What, what is the gospel and what is the resurrection? And what, are we, what is it that we believe? Because in the early church, there were, um, and we still see it today, there were people that were trying to pick and choose. Well, I believe this part of that story, but I'll, I want to discard that part, right? I'll, I like that this, this part appeals to me, but that part doesn't appeal to me. And so Paul's you know, been trying to deal with some of that. And so already he, in this chapter, he's already declared, you know, the, the historical reality of Jesus um, and the, the reality of him rising from the dead, that he was seen by hundreds of witnesses. Um, but some people in Corinth, like I said, were confused. Is there a physical resurrection? Is it spiritual? Is it metaphor? And so he's made it, you know, point after point, he's making it clear, right, that there's a literal physical resurrection that happened, and there's a literal physical resurrection in the future of all those who believe. Now, to be, to be you know, to make it clear, if, if we die right now, if you're a believer, uh, he says that we go to be, we are present with the Lord, but there's still a future for you. He's going to have a literal physical body for you at some point that's going to be different. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we go. But so he asks a bunch of rapid-fire questions in this chapter, right? He says that if there's no resurrection, what are we even doing here, right? Uh, what were the disciples going on and on about? Why would they even bother if that wasn't real? Uh, if there's no resurrection, we're still in our sins, right? That was part of the deal is he defeated death hell and the grave. If there's no resurrection, there's no hope. If there's no resurrection, everything else is false, is basically Paul's point. And maybe you've, you've heard, uh, I think it was, was it C.S. Lewis that talked about this, this argument of liar, lunatic, or Lord, right? That's, you have three choices, which is really two, uh, when it comes to the person of Jesus, Right? We, we like to pick and choose, and there are some people, even in the church, who would say that, uh, well, you know, Jesus was a great teacher, but he wasn't divine. He's not God. Right? Or he's a great teacher, and he's one of the prophets, but he didn't rise from the dead. Right? These are things that people will say and teach. But none of that can be true, because this, this great teacher you're talking about said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? That, I, that the Father and I are, are one, and, and, you know, basically he says, I am God. So if, if he's a good teacher, but he's not God, he's a liar, or he's a lunatic, or he's Lord, right? So you can't have it both ways, right? You can't, you can't pick and choose and do the, the cafeteria-style uh, Christianity. So we're going to get into all uh, the rest of Paul's argument as we go throughout this chapter, but let's go ahead and pray and then we'll get into it. Uh, Lord, we thank you this morning for giving us another opportunity to study your word and to fellowship, uh, to worship. God, as we're, uh, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians is just full of uh, the truth of the gospel and the resurrection and our future. 
uh, in you. Lord, we just pray that you would help us to understand that and through that to understand you better, to see you more clearly and see what it is you would have us do. Lord, we, uh, we pray all these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. All right, so 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29. He says, otherwise, now remember last week, Pastor Chris talked all about the, the resurrection and the two atoms and all that stuff. And, and he says, remember, this is the context that people are doubting whether there is a resurrection. Verse 29, he says, otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? So this is a weird, this is a weird verse. Uh, I, I found, I looked through all my different commentaries and stuff, I found approximately 40 different interpretations on this verse. Um, the, the, Mormon, uh, the Mormons, since 1840, they have used this verse to support uh, proxy baptism. So it's something they practice that we do not believe in, right? That um, basically, that's the reason that uh, they're so into genealogy, right? They've built the biggest geneal- genealogical database in the world so that a living Mormon can be baptized for a deceased relative in, uh, you know, in their place. So there's a big problem with that. Part of, that, part of the problem with that is just the understanding of what baptism is. Uh, the Bible doesn't teach baptismal regeneration, and that's just a fancy way of saying baptism doesn't save someone. It doesn't send someone to heaven. Uh, you know, the thief on the cross was saved with, without being baptized. Um, Paul told the, the Corinthians... That, uh, he was, that God did not call him to baptize, but to preach the gospel. He only baptized a few people. But he, did, he also talks a little bit about what baptism is, and, and it is important. It's not, but he said, you know, when it comes to saving someone, that is not what it does. It's like having a, um, a wedding reception. You know, it's, it doesn't make you married, uh, but it lets everyone around you know that you are, right? That this is the, the, the choice you've made. And also it is a thing that we're commanded to do as, as a step in our discipleship. So it is something you should do. I don't want to diminish it. But if you think that that's what sends someone to heaven, it, it creates, that's how you start to build problematic and eventually false doctrines. And so this verse, they, the, this is the only verse that the Mormon church has to support this practice that they have. And it's the only time that it's mentioned in the Bible. So the reason I'm even spending time on this is that there's an important concept here. Paul is mentioning something that does not mean he is endorsing it. Uh, not everything in the Bible is endorsed by God. Like, I've, you know, people, I've heard people say, well, the Bible teaches polygamy, right? You can have multiple wives because people did. I'm like, yeah, and people murdered and did all kinds of weird stuff with animals and all kinds of stuff in, in the Bible. But that doesn't mean that's what God wants you to do. There's never a verse where God supports the idea of polygamy, but it's mentioned. And so Paul's mentioning a thing that was happening then and, and, and still happens now. So there's a couple things that it, he could be talking about. There was a temple in a neighboring city that practiced this. They were not Christians at all. It was a pagan practice. And we've talked about that throughout 1 Corinthians, that that was one of the problems as they had incorporated a lot of pagan practices into the church and tried to mix the two. There was also a movement in the early church um, and that persisted for centuries uh, called Gnosticism. And the Gnostics, uh, they denied the idea of a physical resurrection, but they still, some of the, a branch of them practiced this uh, baptism for the dead. And so Paul is basically saying, what the heck, right? Your, your doctrine is so messed up and inconsistent that you're talking out about both sides of your mouth. There is no resurrection, but just in case we'll be baptized for the dead, just, you know. Uh, 
So today we might put it this way, right? If, if Christ wasn't raised, why do you embalm your dead, right? Or if Christ wasn't raised, why do you put uh, your deceased relative in a fancy box to preserve their body, right? All of those practices came about be, uh, out of the idea that one day their body would be resurrected. Now, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily think he's going to put that particular body back together, and we'll talk about that as we go on. But, you know, that's, that's why we bury bodies uh, with their heads facing west, so that they would, the idea was that they would rise and face the eastern sky and all this stuff. So why do we do those things if we don't believe in the resurrection? Verse 30, he says, Why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you, uh, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. And he says, you know, why do I put myself through the things I go through if, if this isn't real? Paul was persecuted and beaten and thrown in prison. And, uh, and in 2 Corinthians, he's going to go into detail about, you know, some of the things that he's gone through. And if there's no resurrection, why would I bother? That's what he says. Then in verse 32, he says, If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Now he mentions here the beasts at Ephesus. This could be a couple things. Um, The church oral tradition is that Paul was... Uh, you know, one time was tried to, they tried to feed him to lions, and uh, maybe that's it. But I, we do know one thing that happened at Ephesus, for sure, uh, that's mentioned in Acts 19. And you can go and read that on your own. But basically, Paul is, is preaching at Ephesus, and um, Ephesus had a thriving market place where they, they fashioned idols and little statues of false gods. And Paul comes in and says, there's only one true God. And he was getting converts, and it was causing these uh, idol makers to lose some business. And so there's one guy in particular, Demetrius, was a silversmith, and he's basically he gets everybody on his side against Paul. He says, he's hurting our business. He's hurting our bottom line because, you know, we make statues of the goddess um, Artemis or Diana, and, and he says she doesn't exist. And so they... They get a mob together. They drag Paul into this, this theater in town that holds about 24,000 people. It's still there today. Uh, and for two hours, they, they just work themselves into a fervor. They're, they're chanting, you know, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And, 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 you know, basically Paul is looking at getting torn limb from limb by this crowd. Uh, eventually, things die down. He's able to escape and all of that. But, so Paul says, look, I faced that. Why would I put up with that? Why would I face that crowd and be willing to be torn apart by them if I didn't really believe what I'm talking about? Because if it's not real, if it's not true, if there is no life after death, then just eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. Right? Get what you can get because this is it. And he's actually quoting from Isaiah 22 he, you know, this is when the Babylonians had surrounded Jerusalem, and he says, you know, if we don't believe in a resurrection, we're no better off than the backslidden people of Jerusalem were back then, right? We're just surrounded by corruption. We're going to die, so just go live it up, I guess. Verse 33, he says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Now you may notice that bad, that last part, bad company corrupts good morals, has quotation marks around it. Paul is actually quoting a secular author of the time. There was a guy, a Greek author named Menander. He, he wrote a uh, play, a comedy, and, and it had this line in it. It was a little different. It was, uh, evil company corrupts uh, good habits. So he's kind of paraphrasing. It'd be a little bit like you know me making a, a reference to a, you know the last Avengers movie or something. Everybody would know you know what I'm talking about. But 
it doesn't make the statement untrue, right? Because all truth is God's truth. God is truth, and, and he inspires Paul to write these words down. And I believe they are true, right? We, we need to be careful who we listen to and how we spend our time. I heard uh, Chuck Swindoll talk about this one time where he mentioned uh, putting on you know, a pair of clean white gloves and then sticking your hands in the mud. And when you pull your hands out, the mud does not get glovey, right? but the gloves get muddy. Uh, so be, you know, just be careful what you surround yourself with. It's, it's a, a good thing to keep in mind. And so Paul, he's saying, you know, where, where are you getting these mixed up ideas about the resurrection? Where are you spending your time? What are, what are you allowing to influence you? Because it's not the word of God that gave you that idea. If you keep hanging out with those who deny the resurrection, it will hurt you. And it's something, you know, we, we invite people and ideas into our homes every day through uh, the entertainment we consume, right? And I'm not going to give you a list of you can watch these movies and not those, but you know sometimes when you're watching something that whether this is kind of hostile toward what God says is true. And little by little, that stuff creeps in. So, he says, verse 34, become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. He says there are people in the church that they don't, I don't know what it is they believe, but it's not in the God of the Bible. And there are people in your life that don't know him, and you're being influenced by them rather than you influencing them. Then in first, verse 35, he, he gives us a little you know, what-if scenario. He says, uh, but someone will say, and this someone is a skeptic or this person that doesn't believe in the resurrection, right? He says, the, the, this unbelieving person will say, well, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? And that's a fair question, right? Because as a general rule, uh, dead people stay dead, right? It's a... Not something we see on the regular, a resurrected body. And so if, if I'm going to be resurrected someday, what kind of body am I going to have? Do they come back with the same body? Uh, someone asked Siri about it back there, it sounds like. Uh, and so Paul, being Paul, he's so kind and, uh, and gentle with his answer in the next verse. You fool. Idiot is basically what he says. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Right? What goes into the ground is not what comes out. In Philippians chapter 3, he gives us a little insight to this. Verse 20. I'm going to read this out of the NIV. He says, uh, But our citizenship... Is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. He says, This is as a citizen of heaven, as a believer, as a child of God, one of the things that Jesus is going to do is transform this lowly body into something different, that it more closely resembles him. Now, as we live and breathe and walk out our faith here on earth, that transformation should be happening little by little, right? We should be more and more like him. But at some point, he says, he's going to transform, totally change the body you have. You know, back in 1 Corinthians 15, he, he gives a few more examples to help you know, explain what he's getting at. Uh, verse 37, he says, That which you sow, you do not sow the body um, which is to be, 
but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else, right? When you, it's not like you put, you know, one seed in the ground and it grows one seed, right? It, it's going to transform. But God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. And so the transformation that God uh, brings about in a seed is what he wants to do with you, right? What you are is going to be transformed into something much more, something greater, something capable of more, something related but different, something more beautiful. Now, I guess if you tested it, you know, Genetically, you'd be able to tell that one came from the other, but they're not the same. Right? There's a harvest versus a seed, basically. Verse 39 says, all flesh is not the same flesh. There's one flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, another of fish. There's also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another. So he's just you know, giving them example after example. You know, things in the sky are not all the same. People are not all the same. There's, there's one glory of the sun, verse 41, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For stars differ from star in glory. So stars, you know, stars are beautiful, but they're, if you look at them, you know, from the, with the naked eye, they all look the same. Under a little closer examination, uh, one is going to be a little bit different color, one is going to be a different temperature, one is a different size. And so it will be different for each of us. Because sometimes we've had people ask that question, right? I had a, a child who died as an infant. When I, you know, will they be an infant forever? I don't think so. I think, you know, my guess is we're going to be more closely, you know, related to what Jesus was when, uh, when he was crucified, maybe? Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. Like, we were not given that answer, but we do know it where somehow we know each other. We will know and be known. Uh, it will be different for each of us. I'm praying that my new body will be shredded with an amazing metabolism because <laughs> that, that is something I've not ever experienced. Uh, but Paul says, you know, whatever it is, however you're going to look or however it's going to be, it's going to be something related but better and greater and more beautiful. Uh, verse 42, and he says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. And that's important to remember. This, your meat wagon has a shelf life, right? No matter how well you take care of it, it is perishable. It will expire. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor and raised in glory. It's sown in weakness and raised in power. It's sown in dishonor. When you die, you lose all muscle control. Uh, very often the bowel and the, and the bladder let go. Uh, somebody is going to see you naked. Someone who you would prefer not ever see you naked. And so no matter how glorious your life, uh, you will go out that same way. It, it's part of why we cover bodies, to hide just the, the humiliation. I don't want anybody to see him or her like that. But that's not the end, he says, for you. If you've trusted Jesus, your life doesn't end only in humiliation. You will be raised in glory. Verse 44. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Now, don't get it messed up, right? He's not saying, like, the resurrection body is not just going to be only spirit, right? He's not saying, like, we're going to be like phantoms or like Casper, 
or something. Uh, but it will be a body like Jesus had after his resurrection. He did things that our natural body can't do. Uh, you know, there's a little scene where we see that he ate, right? He was still able to eat, which is something our natural body can do. But he had people touch his scars. And, but he also passed through walls, and, did, you know, there was something different about that body. Different enough that people didn't really res- uh, recognize him immediately until he would speak, or, you know, there was something different. Verse 45, so also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul or a living being. The last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. He's getting a little wordy here. He says, the first man is from earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. And Pastor Chris talked about this last week, right? We Basically, there are two types of Adam. The first Adam, the, you know, the man that God created from the dust, and, and he brought sin into the world. And so there was a new Adam, this Jesus, who uh, brought the cure to sin into the world. Um, where are we at? Verse 47, the first man is from earth, earthy, the second man is from heaven. Verse 48, as is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have been born in the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. So basically, uh, he just says, you know, our current bodies are earthly bodies, and they bear a resemblance to Adam. And with that comes every benefit and curse of that, right? We are under the same curse that he and Eve brought into the world. We have a sin nature, we have, the, um, we have sickness and all that stuff. And these current bodies can't handle the full glory of God. I'm reminded in the Old Testament, you may recall, Moses, uh, you know, he spent some time talking with God and, and he, he just wanted to see more of God and he says, God, show me your glory. And, and God says, I can't. If I show you all there is to me, you can't handle it, it will kill you. Because not only am I a God of love, of, you know, and of peace and of forgiveness, but I'm also a God of judgment and you know, you're, you're going to see the whole thing and you would see every sin that you ever you know, committed and, and the weight of it and you just can't handle that and survive. But here's what I'll do for you, Moses. And he tucked him into the cleft of the rock. You know, the rock of ages cleft for me. Uh, let me hide myself in thee. So he put him there, and he says, I'll pass by, and I'll let you just see a glimpse, you know, a little taste of my glory. And he did, and, and when Moses came down the mountain to, to, to speak to the Israelites, just from that little passing glimpse of God, the, his reflection glowed, his face shone so brightly that he had to wear a veil for a while because people were like, they couldn't look at Moses because he had looked at just a glimpse of God. And he says, so your body can't handle the full glory of God, but I want you to have that. And so you're going to get a new body, which will be like Jesus' resurrected body, a glorified body. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, he says this. He says, Beloved, now we are children of God, And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. And this is the part that gets me every time. Because we will see him just as he is. Now John had walked and talked with Jesus. He had shared meals with him. He had seen him crucified and he had seen the resurrected Jesus. If anybody knew how Jesus was, it was, it was John. And he said, I, you know, everything I wrote down is just, there aren't enough books in the world to explain what I, the things I've seen. And I know that I've only just seen the tip of the iceberg. And Paul had a similar experience. Now, he didn't meet Jesus until he had already been resurrected. 
But in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12, he said this. He says, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Mirrors back then were not made of glass like they are now. They were made of polished metal, polished bronze, and you know they were a little cloudy. He says, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. So like John and like Paul, I look forward to a time when I won't have any questions or any doubts. Um, in John 13, when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet, um, you know Peter doesn't understand what's happening and kind of protests, and, and Jesus says, look, what I do now you do not understand, but you will hereafter. Those questions that we have that we can't quite find the answer to. Now, sometimes we've not looked hard enough, right? We've not actually taken the answer that he put in his word, but those questions like exactly what will my body look like, I don't know, I don't know, but you'll find out, and he promised me that whatever it is I don't know now, I will So I look forward to a time when I won't have those questions or any doubts and when I'll have a body that's fully capable of being in the presence of God. In the meantime, here's what we do. I'm going to try to be a little bit closer to him today. I'm going to try to see a little bit more clearly who he is tomorrow. I'm going to be careful which voices I allow to live rent-free in my head, right? Who I'm listening to. And no matter what I face this week, I know that it's okay. Because my Redeemer lives. Job chapter 19, we'll close with this. This text. Because part of what Paul was dealing with in the early church is is the world doubted the idea of any kind of resurrection, as it does today. And, And some will say, well, that was because it was so foreign concept, no one had ever talked about it, or or you know, it's only a Christian idea, or um But the fact of the matter is, is in the earliest written book that we know of, Job, now Genesis talks about earlier events, but Job, we believe, is the earliest written down account. Job has this to say. Job 19, verse 25. He says, As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. He says, so even after this body is destroyed, I'm going to have another one where I will see God face to face. And that can get me through anything. Let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you this morning for giving us an opportunity to study your word. And as we're reading and studying these, these heavy truths, uh, life-giving truths about the, what is the gospel and the resurrection and what it is you have in store for us, Lord, it, it can be easy for us to miss the forest for the trees. And so God, we, we just pray this morning that those of us that have a relationship with you through, through your son Jesus, that, Lord, that we would live that out today and tomorrow and this week uh, with a new fervor, with a new zeal, that we would seek to see your face and to know you better and to, and to show you to the world. But God, we know that there are many listening, whether here or, or via the internet or whatever the case may be, who don't have that relationship with you. Lord, we, we pray that you would open their eyes to the truth that, that you so loved them 
that you sent your son to, to die in their place. And that if we would just believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and that he can do the things he says he can do, that we have eternal life. Not we have a hope of it someday, not we may be able to deserve it, but we have it through the finished work that you did on the cross. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for that. We pray that if anyone has made that decision, uh, that you would put them in touch with uh, another believer to help steer them uh, closer to you. But more than anything, Lord, we just pray that your will would be done and that you would come and come quickly. And all God's people said, amen. All right, ready? Break. Break. All right.